Hello, welcome to another episode of Wild Living with Sunny. I'm in Tucson, Arizona for the mesquite harvest and no mesquite ain't just for barbecue. This lovely leguminous plant puts on these pods and they're pretty much going off the hook right now in the Sonoran Desert. They make a delicious flower. We're gonna learn how to use them in a dish. And in addition, I'd like to introduce you to a gentleman who is a master mesquite harvester as well as can teach us a lot about harvesting rainwater in this arid environment. So let's go get introduced. My name is Brad Lancaster and I'm one of the uh, uh, one of many people that have made desert harvesters happen. The way things got started here is uh, my brother and I um, purchased this property in 1994. We bought the house uh, for 33000 and we strove to ensure that living here would also be affordable. And we never have a combined utility bill of all gas, water, and electric of more than $30 a month. And, Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's before we put in the solar system. Wow. So now it's even lower. Uh, we predominantly get around by bicycle and foot because um, we're in a central neighborhood. We plant the rain. We plant the gray water in the soil. So. Anywhere we have vegetation, we plant in sunken mulch basins that um, grabs, infiltrates, and holds on to the water. And that's dramatically reduced the water needs of um, the landscape, while at the same time enabling rainwater to become the primary irrigator, household gray water, it's the water from sinks, bathtubs, and washing machine, to be the secondary irrigator, and municipal or well water rarely ever used. That does not uh, we don't use more than 5% of our total water use uh, in the landscape comes from municipal or well sources. So, and you're also off-grid. Yep, we get all our electricity from the sun. This is really a living almanac. So, I find for me and for others, you know, to really get engaged with wild foods is you, you have to have a relationship with it. And for any relationship to be strong, there has to be regular interaction. So we can just step right outside our door and we see when things are blooming, when the fruit is on, when the pods are on. This is a native velvet mesquite tree. So people plant mesquites all the time, but if you want maximum wildlife habitat, minimum maintenance, minimum water needs, and maximum food production, I highly recommend the velvet mesquite in this area um, because it's the most robust, drought tolerant, and sustains the most uh, wildlife out of the available mesquites. The screw bean mesquite's another good one, but takes a little bit more water. So here's the pod of the velvet mesquite, and I can just chew on it as such. I'm not eating the seeds because they're too hard, but I like to eat the pod around the seed. And I can soak this in water and make a wonderful drink too. But if you go to the Desert Harvesters website, well, bam, there's the shirt for it, <laughs> www.desertharvesters.org. You'll see the schedule of events and how we have put a hammer mill on a trailer to take it around to different neighborhoods and communities so people can very rapidly grind the whole pods into very fine mesquite flour. It's naturally sweet um, and it doesn't have gluten though, so people typically add uh, wheat flour or spelt um, to get the breads and whatnot to hold together. How long until the uh, po the tree starts producing pods? Um, let's see. We usually start getting pods after planting a five-gallon tree the second year. Oh wow! Yeah. One of the other advantages of the velvet mesquite over, say, the South American varieties is you get two um, harvests a year. You get a pre-summer monsoon harvest, which is going on right now in the month of June. And you'll also get a post-monsoon uh, harvest. So it's the winter rains that spark the first uh, flush of pods, and it's the summer rains that flush, the, uh, flush out the second. Um, so you get a lot more production. Another key thing, when harvesting, don't just go to any mesquite and just start picking pods. You want to uh, pick the pod from the tree and then taste it. So here's just a couple little ones I hadn't gotten yet. And this one tastes good to me, so I want to pick from this tree. But if I were to go across the street to that mesquite over there, it's not good. <laughs> okay, there's just that natural variability. So one thing you really want to watch out for is mold. 
um, mold. It, I don't have any examples right now because we're in the dry months, but it's a black uh, discoloring of the pods. So if you see that, discard those pods. Uh, a good way to avoid it is just to pick your pods from the trees instead of picking them from the ground because the ones in the trees, they get more ventilation and less likely for uh, mold to form. The other way to avoid it is try and pick most of your pods in the pre-monsoon harvest before you got that moisture that's going to generate the mold. Um, and then after you've harvested, before you send the stuff through the mill, just be looking at your pods. That's something we do at the mill. We're, we have everyone double check and then we're checking as we feed the pods in. We find mold, we discard it. So that can just make people sick if you eat any of the molded um, pods? Yeah, um, we, we've heard reports, haven't experienced it directly, but I just heard reports of um, some individuals getting really sick mm -hmm. um, from ingesting too many of, that, of those molds. All and right. we just want to avoid mm -hmm. those potential health risks. 95% of the vegetation is native or indigenous to the Tucson base. So basically we brought back um, an island of the Sonoran Desert ecosystem within the urban core just north of downtown Tucson. When we moved here we only had pigeons um, as the wildlife uh, and since the vegetation has started to mature um, we now have over two dozen native bird species. So I really recommend folks check out the Desert Harvesters website and see that it's really a lot more than just picking and eating mesquite. We're trying to show folks um, how you plant the rain before you plant the trees and then show them how to plant the trees and encourage more of this in neighborhoods. So I, it's great if people go out into the desert and experience that, but it'd be so much better if they could also bring the desert or the natural ecosystem into their neighborhood. So you don't have to work to have that experience and that enjoyment. Um, so we're trying to enhance the production of the natural system. And then we want to show people how to process, harvest and all. Um, and then we want them to enjoy it. So we make a point of when we have these milling events, um, it's a communal event. And when we have, uh, ideally, it's also coupled with mesquite pancake chow down with prickly pear syrup and whatnot. It's yummy. And live music. So the idea there is it's really a celebration. And you're bringing people together, you're sharing ideas, you're getting to know one another. So you're reconnecting with the natural world, you're reconnecting with the human world and it's just so much richer and juicier that way. Okay, so now we'll make up some uh, mesquite pancakes and we're mixing the mesquite flour with uh, whole wheat pastry flour. Um, that way the, uh, the pancakes uh, come out a bit nicer. Because <laughs> if it's just straight uh, mesquite, it can be a little more cracker-like because it doesn't have the gluten holding everything together. One thing I want to show you, if you are to um, make some mix yourself, and I'm going to put some in. You'll notice that a lot of times with the mesquite, the flour takes up water and uh, just in the atmosphere and stuff. So you can see here the, the chunks of mesquite flour. So I like to use this little sifter to process that out and go through them. So I'll do a little spinning and if that's not sufficient, I just push with my hand, uh, push it through the screen. And that way you're not going to get just a big chunk of pure mesquite, everything will get mixed in real well. Okay, so this is about the consistency we're going for here. And uh, just so I don't forget, if you guys want the recipe for this, you can go to desertharvesters.org and hit the recipe uh, menu button. And this is Anastasia's Pancake Mix. So here we are cooking outside because it's June in Tucson, Arizona. And it's hot, <laughs> so it's a lot nicer uh, energy efficiency wise to be cooking outside rather than inside. That way we don't heat up the house when we don't want to. Um, so one of the things I'm doing right now is uh, I got the pancakes cooking. You can see the air bubbles just starting to come up through the batter, waiting for that. A little, little more bubbles come up and then I'll flip them. One thing with mesquite is it burns real easily. So you might find that you want to set your um, flame a little lower, or if you're cooking pie crust or whatnot, set the oven setting a little lower. And that's actually a big reason why I love cooking or baking breads, mesquite breads, in a solar oven. These things are much less likely to burn. 
So mesquite ain't just for barbecue. These pancakes are divine. They are really good, Brad. Thank you. Yeah. How do you like them, Salem? Why? They're good, aren't they? <laughs> so again, be sure to visit Brad's website for the recipe, www.desertharvesters.org, and you will not be disappointed. So thanks so much. You bet. Yeah. <laughs> Chow down. Woohoo! Yeah.